Mike Paul Kengor. So tell me, uh, is it? Is, and I always tell guests, feel totally free to differ with me. It's an it's a non-issue. Uh, so, am I right or wrong in you, in your opinion about what a, a typical college student today could not identify? And I went through that that list. Oh yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And and I, I mean, look, I mean, a big problem with um, I, I mean, here we are. We're we're in a cancel culture today, Dennis. Right where. Any statement that anybody ever made in the past, any attitude, any sort of racial statement can, can get you canceled. And, you know, they went after Reagan last year around this time for something he said to Richard Nixon in 1972. Um, you know, they've gone after everyone from Washington and Jefferson to even Lincoln. I mean, they're tearing down statues of Frederick Douglass, of all people. And you got a guy like Karl Marx who said some of the most hideous things on race uh, to, in regard to blacks, in regard to women. His anti-Semitic statements are, are blood-curdling. They're, they're really remarkable. And, I mean, if, if any conservative said even one of these things that, that Marx said, dozens upon dozens of students or statements, students would be on campuses you know, demanding to be, you know, demanding entrance into professors' offices who have busts of Karl Marx, right? I mean, this guy, uh, this guy had really vile views, and that doesn't even go into the ideological issue, the spiritual issue, which I know is what we're going to talk about. His views on his views on God, and even his really quite chilling and diabolical writings on the devil, of all things. Yes, that even I'm not aware of, and Marxism and communism were my field of specialty, ironically. I, you know, by the way, on a personal note, I think you'll find this of interest. So I, I studied what was called communist affairs uh, at the Columbia University School of International Affairs. I actually studied under Brzezinski. Wow. Uh, yeah, who gave wow. the, the advanced seminar on communism. And there were like six of us in all of Columbia. I had a very rare major, communist affairs. And I remember when I left Columbia after two years of graduate school, I remember thinking, you know, it was a fascinating major, but it, it, it's not going to be important because communism, not then, but within 15, 16 years, died in Europe. And I thought, phew, it's a good thing I didn't enter the field. Little did I know how important that major would actually be. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was, I was an undergraduate major pre-med at the University of Pittsburgh when I read Zbigniew Brzezinski's book, The Grand Failure, right? I think mm -hmm. that came out around 1989. And at that point, he had been in the Carter administration, really the, you know, the, the best staffer that Jimmy Carter had, probably one of the only good staffers that Jimmy Carter had. He was an anti-communist Pole, right, a mm -hmm. native Pole. Mm-hmm. And that was uh, that was about the time. So it's when the Cold War collapsed, uh, you know, ended, 1989. Berlin Wall fell in 1989. Soviet Union disintegrated in 1991. But at the same time, guys like me, you, and others, you know, we we've been warning people in the 1990s, early 2000s that if you don't start to teach this past, the evils of communism, what happened in the Cold War, this could come back to bite us. And here we are today, I don't know, when does she speak her 60 seconds of the Democrat convention, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, probably this week, maybe even tonight, but she was, AOC was born, if this is correct, it's off the top of my head, I think October 1989. So she was, she was four weeks old nursing at her mother's breast when the Berlin Wall fell. And then you know, she spent, grew up probably going to public schools and then went off to college, and she learned none of this. And now here she is today. She fancies herself a quote-unquote democratic socialist, not understanding that socialism is one of the transitionary steps to communism, at least, at least according to Marxist-Leninist theory it is. But, but people like her, we have a whole generation that never learned any of this. So I, kind of like you, I... I got my master's degree at American University, the School of International Service, what was it, 1994. 
And I, I had some of those same thoughts. I thought, well, you know, should I really even be studying this? I mean, maybe I should just go focus on, and I did, I focused more on the Middle East than, than I, I initially started with Latin America. But, but here we are, 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and you now have a majority of young Americans saying that they prefer socialism over capitalism, and many of them even saying positive things about communism, and even favoring the uh, the abolition of private property. Teen so Vogue just had insane. a yes. Teen Vogue just had a a piece for kids to read that we yeah. should there should be no private property. That's exactly right. Yeah, I wrote a piece for the American Spectator about two weeks ago called "Teen Vogue to Teen Girls: Marx Good, Reagan Bad," and <laughs> and it, it talked about a hit piece that they had just done on Reagan, and it reminded them of a positive piece they had done on Marx a few months before that. And then, lo and behold, in between, you're right, I think it was just last week, somebody sent it to them. They said, hey, check this out. And they were literally calling for, quote, abolition of private property, unquote. And the Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto, they write, Quote, the entire theory of the communists may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property, unquote. And you know, a lot of the people that probably read Teen Vogue, a lot of them, probably most of them, teen girls presumably, they have no idea that comes out of the Communist Manifesto. But, but it does, and magazines like this are able to get away with this because we've now educated or miseducated a couple generations of young people who have no clue no clue what, what, what communism or socialism even are. There was, it was a French socialist who said all property is theft. I, f- I forgot who it was, but that, that was one of the original ideas of communism. All yeah, property right. is theft. We'll be back in a moment. Paul Kengor, the book is up at DennisPrager.com, The Devil and Karl Marx. He writes as interestingly as he speaks. The Dennis Prager Show. Okay. Dennis Prager here reminding you it's fundraising month for Prager U. Paul Kangor, the professor I have on the line, is one of those who gives a course there. We have a couple of courses on communism in case your kid is your college or high school son or daughter, nephew, niece, grandchild, is flirting with the idea of communism. They should see these videos. Amazing, the uh, enforced ignorance of history. The Devil and Karl Marx, Paul Kegor's book. So, what's this with, I I studied Marx, I did not know about the devil part, so tell me. Yeah, it's really shocking. (laughs) I mean, mean, the, the guy wrote poetry about the devil, and people don't know this about Marx, but Marx actually fancied himself a poet. And, and really, Dennis, if he hadn't become a philosopher, and he probably shouldn't have because he was a pretty bad philosopher, um, actually he was a pretty bad poet, too, at least in terms of what he was writing about. But he, he fancied himself a poet, and he wrote, he wrote a bunch of poems about, about Satan. And, and it's hard to tell at times to what extent these are autobiographical, um, to what extent he's talking about um, the devil kind of playing the devil himself if he's um if he's supportive of of the devil's vision it's it's hard to say and i say that in the book i try to make these careful distinctions where and when i can but for example his 1837 poem this is called the pale maiden and i think this one dennis is really profound because i i think this is autobiographical for marx he wrote thus heaven i forfeited I know it full well. My soul, once true to God, is chosen for hell, unquote. And you know, Marx had been, Marx was raised in, a, in a, a Jewish family that had many rabbis in the background. Well, uh, you know, Orthodox rabbis, both his father's father and mother's father. That it's, it's, a, it's a good question. They, they seem to be on both sides. And as you know, it, depending on whether or not they were reformed or whether or not... They oh, no, they were orthodox. Were. I think I, 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 this is an, an area that I, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat acquainted with. But, of course, his parents converted to Christianity. 
They did. They converted to Christianity. So Marx was born May 5th, 1818, in Trier, Germany, and which ironically is one of the most religious Catholic cities in all of Germany. In fact, the, the great cathedral of Trier is the one where Helena, St. Helena, the mother of, a, the, the mother of um, Constantine, of all things, she went to the Holy Land, and she's alleged to have brought back a number of, of holy relics, um, in, including the crown of thorns of Jesus, which, which is believed to be in Notre Dame. She brought back the holy robe, the holy coat of Christ, she believed to be, and, and that's the one that the Roman soldiers cast lots for at the crucifixion. That's in the, that's in the Cathedral of Trier, and, and that's the town that Marx was raised in. So that cathedral goes back to, I think, the year 324, 330, um, St. Ambrose, who taught Augustine, the Bishop of Milan, Ambrose, was there at one point. So he grew up in the literal shadow of that cathedral. His father converted to, to Christianity. It's believed to be under the social pressures and persecution of the day against Jews in Germany. And Marx, I think he converted, Marx would have been around four or five years, well, probably, Marx would have been about two years old, we think, probably, because the father probably converted around 1820. And then Marx was baptized into the faith 1823, when he was five years old. The, Marx's mother, she was reluctant to convert, and she did later, but she was never very passionate about the faith. So the father became Lutheran, Marx became Lutheran, and, and, and the father, to his credit, the, you know, the father believed in God. And you know, he was never very orthodox in whatever he believed in, the Lutheran faith, the Protestant faith. If he had been Jewish before, that's the father. But he told Carl, he, he, said, he said, listen, it is good for man to believe in God. This is a good thing, right? It's like the rudder of faith. The, the, this moral compass will, will help you. And so Karl Marx grew up... You know, somewhat of a Christian. I, I don't know how faithful he was about it, but we know that he left the faith when he got to college, the University of Bonn, where he connected with this awful theology professor who was, who was teaching atheism, a guy named Bruno Bauer. And by the way, one of the first of several intimate influences of Marx, who was very anti-Semitic, it's, it's, again, astonishing to see this guy's anti-Semitic writings. I mean, there, you, if, if, you, if you were to put up on a board certain quotes from Marx and, and you ask somebody, said, who said this? Some people might say Hitler said That's right. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's that bad. It, it's that bad. So, so Marx, he left the faith in college around uh, early 20s, and then by 1841, he and his professor, Bruno Bauer, we're launching a journal called the Archives of Atheism. So it was in college that he lost the faith. Let and me, I want to, in light of that, I just want to remind my listeners, people ask, when did American University start going left? It's when American professors, or actually graduate students, went to Germany in the late 19th century because American universities were not granting doctorates generally. So they went for their doctorates in Germany, and already what you're reporting, in the 1830s, a young student named Karl Marx is turned anti-Christian, ultimately anti-God, anti-Semitic, anti-West, and that's already working in German universities in the earlier part of the 19th century. We send our best and brightest in the 19th century, and they come back with the ideas that have given us our modern university. So it's yeah. ironic that you should be reporting this. Yeah, and I'm, I'm careful to try not to dump on Germany too much, but, but I'll, I'll tell you, Dennis, it's really what happened in Germany in the 1800s, early 1900s, uh, uh, Ralph de Toledano called it Berlin Babylon at one point in the early 19. That's in the early 1900s he said that. But you got Marx and Engels were there. Um, Mikhail Bakunin, who's one of these atheist, socialist, weird, anarchist philosophers who referred to, didn't believe in God, but hailed Satan as the first rebel. Lucifer, who, who to quote Saul Alinsky, Lucifer, who, who earned himself his own kingdom. 
So these guys have this weird praise for, for Satan, even as, even as they claim to be atheists. But what happened in Germany throughout the 1800s, and then into the early 1900s... All right, hold it there, because I don't want you to tell us. But I want to remind everybody, Paul Kengor's book, The Devil and Karl Marx. It's mind-blowing. It's up at DennisPrager.com. We continue with Professor Kengor when we return. The Dennis Prager Show. Okay, everybody, Dennis Prager here. Professor Paul Kengor, he is a professor of political science at Grove City College. He's an expert on communism. His new book is The Devil and Karl Marx. Now, this this uh, subtitle, Communism's Long March of Death, Deception, and Infiltration, is that the subtitle of the book? Because it's not on the cover. Yeah, it is. It, yeah, it's the subtitle of the book, and uh, it's yeah, it's not it's not on the cover, but it's on the inside of the cover. Yeah. Well, that's what it is. This is the sort of stuff that people uh, need to read. By the way, you're going to come out with an audible. With I, I should yeah I think so I, I believe I believe they're working on it and um, we should in fact now that you say that. <laughs> I'm going to use that to my advantage. Yes, too. that you tell <laughs> them. No, it's very important. Yeah, you're right. It is important. There's so many people nowadays. That's right. Are, um, exactly. are listening. And, and in very. By the way, uh, I am one of them, and I very frequently then get the book because I want to mark up the, the the book either either on Kindle or in the physical edition. So I very right. often end up buying two. Yeah, yeah, and it starts yeah, no, with the with audible. That, you yeah. get, you get, so uh, yes, I am encouraging you to, to tell them. <laughs> this this it. is a. Uh, by the way, what is the story at Grove City? Are you having classes? We are. We actually start back on August twenty fourth. So we start back next week on Monday, and uh, so they're taking all the different precautions. Students wearing masks, and um, I think we professors wear shields, face shields, and social distancing. They're taking everybody's temperature before they leave the dorms in the morning. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully it'll be, it'll go okay. I don't know. We'll see. Well, it, 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 it's, um, see, I, I don't want to get distracted, but I just want to say that I admit that though I am allowing myself to get distracted, but it's so relevant. I mentioned earlier in the show that the University of North Carolina opened up so about 250 students got COVID so they're closing the university again. Right. Uh, if the criterion for closing is students will have COVID, no university, no school will stay open. The, the society has not matured to the understanding that that is the nature of a virus. People get it. The question is not whether people get it. It's whether they get hurt by it. Right. right. And, and young people don't get hurt by it. It's very, right. very rare. It's more common right. to be hurt by the flu if you're 15 than by COVID if you're 15. Yeah, and the, and of course the concern for colleges, I, I think too, is older folks, professors getting it too. Right. I, I would teach. And, I I would go in and teach. Yeah. I, I, I it's well anyway. Look, the fear that has engulfed the the world is uh, is very very bad. But anyway, back to uh, back to the the Marx issue. So. He it is a very interesting aspect that I was not aware of. So there was a a certain fascination with Satan on on the part of Marx. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, very much so. And in, in fact, in, in 1841, the same year that he was starting a an archives of atheism with his professor Bruno Bauer, Marx wrote a, another poem called The Player. And in this one, he wrote, Look now, my blood-dark sword shall stab unerringly within thy soul. The hellish vapors rise and fill the brain till I go mad and my heart is utterly changed. See the sword, the prince of darkness, sold it to me. Uh, that, that's just yet another poem like that. He also did a play called Ulanam, which... Which, if you if you play with it, it's it's an anagram that means Emmanuel, which which was which was the the name of Jesus, and and that's that's according to several of his biographers, Robert Payne and 
and others all can see that that's indeed what Marx meant with that. He he had a fascination with with Faust, with Goethe's Faust, Mephistopheles. Selling your soul to the devil. Yeah, yeah, he, he loved that. In because fact, he knew, he, then, apparently he knew he did that. Well, and and what and one of one of his favorite phrases for, from Mephistopheles is, is that everything that exists deserves to perish. Everything that exists deserves to perish. Wait, wait, wait where is that? that? I'm sorry, where is that from? That that's from Mephistopheles. Oh, it is. It's from Mephistopheles, and and, yeah. and and he and he loved that line. He loved that line. You know, this this is. I, I want to say this to my listeners. This is such an important dialogue or interview. There is, at the core of leftism, is nihilism. I have been saying that, but I, I now realize it's truer than I realized. Starting with Marx. Book is up at uh, DennisPrager.com, The Devil and Karl Marx. It's a scholarly book, but it's written totally accessibly. Can you imagine that, a video seen by millions on how to be a mature person? How many colleges are teaching that? Another recommendation for PragerU, this is is fundraising month. If you've never given to us, please do. The country is in jeopardy. I never overstate, I never exaggerate. Real, serious jeopardy, and we're doing a lot of good to try to stem that. PragerU.com or just call 833-PRAGERU. Whatever you give, we appreciate. Paul Kengor is a professor of political science at Grove City College. Where is Grove City College? Outside of Pittsburgh? It is. It's about an hour north of Pittsburgh, uh, western Pennsylvania, Grove City, Pennsylvania. And I got to say here, uh, you, you didn't ask me to say this, but but the Prager U video that I did for you guys on Karl Marx, I, I got to tell you, Dennis, I got more response to that video than I think just about anything, almost any radio show I've ever done, any article that I've ever written. And you know, I've done I've done a lot of big shows, right? The O'Reilly Factor when that was number one on TV and so forth. And but that was um, the response to that was enormous, and I have heard. I've got more emails from young people about that particular thing, that video, than than anything else. So, believe me, and I know, I think it got within a week. It had three million hits or three million views at your website and at YouTube. So, so the impact that you're having, it's 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 substantial. Thank you for saying that, and I just want to re-emphasize something Professor Kengor said, that it was young people writing him. 65% of our billion views a year are people under 35. Just want people to know that. You want to help the fighters? Help Prager you. So we go back to your book. Uh, it's relentlessly interesting what you're reporting, and it is so important because I this is all revelatory to me who majored in Marxism and communism. And I didn't know the fascination with what was the line again from Mephistopheles? Yeah, and, and I, I grab this during the break. I have a bunch of these listed on page three eighty three of the book, and you, you had mentioned the nihilism behind this. And here's just a few examples. So Marx had a favorite quote from Goethe's Faust, and and Mephistopheles says, "Everything that exists deserves to perish." Everything that exists deserves to perish. And, and I, I think that's very much the mentality of the modern mob who's standing out there tearing down statues, setting things ablaze. And I had somebody a few months ago, a family member, say, hey, what's their goal? What do they want to do? What do they want to replace this with? And a lot of times they don't right. even know. That's what it. That's what I, I told this to Candace Owens, and I remember she was so excited at this because it was a relatively recent revelation in my own life. Mm. Uh, after studying this my whole life, the end game of the left is chaos. Yes. Yes, they, they, they just, and this was Marx. They want to tear down the house, and, and you have this in Marx's poetry. 
and, and in fact, in one really chilling scene where where it, you know, he's standing there amid the embers, right? This burnt down house, and in a way, they've achi- they've achieved what they want to achieve, which is flat out destruction. And if you were to say to them, "What comes next?" they might very well say, "I don't know." But you know, Marx, at the end of the man, the the end of the Communist Manifesto. It ends with this. People remember workers of the world unite mm-hmm. and, and have nothing things. to lose but to change, yeah? Yeah, that's right. But Marx and Engels wrote, quote, they, meaning the communists, openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Right? The forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. I mean, that's a statement. I consider this hour with you so important, I should charge people. (laughs) Well, (laughs) and this this one, too, this one, I think, really gets to the people uh, toppling statues. The end of the manifesto, Marx and Engels write this. Communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. So they support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. So you might be at a rally where they're tearing down a statue of Columbus or whatever else, and and, and you'll say, well, why do you guys want to do this? Why are you with them? These people aren't even thinking about wealth redistribution. They're not talking about class. They're not talking about the bourgeoisie. And the honest communist who is really well-versed in this would have to say, well, you have to understand, we support, as Marx and Engels said, every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. You know, Marx, in a letter to Arnold Rouge, one of his friends, called for the ruthless criticism of all that exists. The ruthless criticism of all that exists. So, I mean, this is totalitarianism, and like you said, it's nihilism. It, it, you know, Chaos. It's about tearing An- down anarchy. the house. Yes. Where did you get this? This is really important to me. Uh, I'm looking at page 383. By the way, it's beautifully uh, printed, the book, and it's good paper. It is nice, isn't it? They did a good job, uh, 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 and I just want you to convey that to the publisher along with the message of an audible. But uh, the um, uh, where did you get this? Marx had a favorite quote from Goethe's Faust, everything that exists deserves to perish. The... Because there's no footnote there. Tell me, where did you get that? I consider this really important. Yeah, you, so you'll find that throughout the first part and second part. So on page 383, I didn't footnote any of those because they're already um, they're already given throughout the book a number of times. It okay. It's redundant, I think, to footnote them again. No, that's but, fine. But that's, that's very well known, including by Robert Payne. Who um, who was the really wrote the book on Marx back in the yes I read that yeah that, that's a it's a long time uh, book yeah that's that's from the sixties yeah. or so yeah it's great it's great and if you look too on the next page three eighty four I think this is really important it, in Marx's all right family, hold on hold on we will get to page three eighty four <laughs> the book the devil and Karl Marx up at DennisPrager.com. Here's a novel idea. Support an educational institution that actually teaches your values. Prager University. Go to PragerUniversity.com and donate today. Yeah, and you'll get to see people like Paul Kengor. You know, I've had uh, thousands of guests. You're you're really one of the best. You are relentlessly interesting. I appreciate that. Yeah, well, you deserve it. By the way, I have a whole theory. I have theories on everything. That's that's my idiosyncrasy. I have a theory about the word interesting. Uh, it is the most uh, underappreciated, important thing that there is in life. <laughs> you have to be interesting. It doesn't matter how important what you have to say. Or, or I learned it from music. And I, I now apply it to everything else. And, and that's been my success. I fully acknowledge it. I'm interesting. It, yes. uh, other, otherwise, it would be, it would be, I would have another profession. That's all. Well, that's, the, that's the key for professors, too. And that's with, right. With, oh, bless you. Yeah. That's exactly right. When I was in college, I kept thinking, does this guy know how boring he is? <laughs> right. And, and, really, and really, the key is that you have to have interesting information. And then you have to be passionate about it. And so, you know, I appreciate you commending me for being interesting, but a lot of it is because of the content, the material that I'm sharing, right? 
And and when you see what Mark said, and you know, you can't help but be interested in this. Well, you know how important it is because we're reliving it. Mm-hmm. We are living yeah, Santayana are. right now. People who don't learn from history yes. are condemned to repeat it. That's right. That's exactly what's going on. And, you know, I, I checked during break. It is Robert Payne that reported the, the line, uh, everything that exists deserves to perish. And that's also been reported by a number of other biographers, and one of them, Francis Ween, who's very pro-Marx. I mean, apologizes, an apologist for Marx and almost everything. And I, I have a long section of the book where I talk about this journalist friend of Marx, Carl Heinzen, and, and Marx kind of, kind of holds him captive. And, and Heinzen said that, that Marx was his unsuccessful imitation of Mephistopheles. Um, he was sneering at me. He was Wait a minute. At, at me with, I'm not sure it was unsuccessful. Right, right. And chanting the lines of Mephistopheles. A number of people say that. Marx's daughters talk about walking with him in London, and he's telling them these chilling uh, stories and, and reciting lines from Faust. He was fascinated with this stuff. And, and before the break, I, I wanted to mention that the essay where Marx refers to religion as the opium of the masses, and this once again gets back to the whole nihilism point. In, in that essay, he writes there, people forget this, quote, the criticism of religion is the beginning of all criticism. I love it. I love it. This has been yeah, revelatory. Yeah. Paul Kangor, the only thing missing is I have to meet you in person. <laughs> that sounds good. We'll do it sometime. The Dennis Prager Show, live from the Relief Factor Pain-Free Studio. 